Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to CCTV's uh, debate, uh, also a discussion here at the uh, Summer Davos. Uh, the entire session will be televised on CCTV's business channel and uh, together with many other uh, domestic and international channels of the entire CCTV group. Uh, the topic of this discussion is the new frontiers of China's growth. I'm sure uh, immediately following the Premier's uh, keynote speech, we have a lot of uh, subject matters to uh, address amid a very complicated, un unpredictable global uh, growth prospects uh, backdrop. And here on the panel, we have some very outstanding speakers. And first of all, allow me to introduce you um, them one by one. Uh, I'll start with the gentleman next to me, uh, Mr. Li Daokui, uh, one of the uh, leading economists here in China, who is also a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of China's Central Bank. Ambassador Gary Locke, uh, uh, who is probably the most widely known ambassador from the United States ever in China currently, uh, as a Chinese-American uh, politician who was formerly governor of Washington State and also the U.S. Secretary of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Wang Jianling of uh, One Da Group, uh, one of the leading real estate developers and senior business leaders uh, in China, and also uh, probably the, mo the most widely known and uh, the richest person uh, here in the city of Dalian. Uh, and finally, and certainly not the least, Mr. Chris Gopalakrishna, uh, CEO of Infosys. I'm sure uh, you know Infosys uh, as well as you know about Lenovo uh, in China. So um, the subject, first topic that we would like to address here is uh, what's in the news, uh, the global that situation, what's happening uh, in Europe is making a lot of people nervous, including uh, those in China. And unfortunately, the debt problem is not unique to uh, Europe only. Uh, the United States and Japan, virtually um, most of the developed world have some sort of a debt problem, uh, some worse than others. Uh, what's happened in the United States was making uh, us nervous in China as well, uh, including the Chinese stock markets. So I would like to, be, uh, to begin by asking Ambassador Locke. My colleagues told me that you flew coach, economy class, from Beijing to Dalian. Was that a reminder that U.S. still owes China money? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's uh, U.S. government policy, whether we're here in China or even throughout the United States. All U.S. government officials always fly coach. Uh, on our personal travel, if we want to pay uh, the extra money for business class or whatever, that's our own uh, personal decision. But uh, we believe in setting a good example and being good stewards of uh, American taxpayer money. So uh, the requirement is, uh, in virtually all cases, unless you are traveling more than 14 hours and have uh, a meeting immediately or within so many hours after landing, uh, you fly economy. And certainly from Beijing to Dalian is only an hour, so. Uh, economy is very, very comfortable. Your colleague, Secretary Gardner, uh, was on my show twice, and he uh, told me every time when we were together that uh, a strong dollar is in the best interest of the United States. It served the United States' best interest. But now it seems that a weak dollar is in, in the better interest of the United States. Isn't that so? Well, let me just say that uh, uh, we in the United States are very concerned about the world economy. We're also concerned about uh, our own uh, fiscal health. And I think what's really important is that the United States uh, Congress and the President took very decisive action just a few weeks ago in reaching a, uh, an agreement on raising the debt ceiling. Not only did it call for, as part of that agreement, uh, reducing government expenditures, uh, but also calling for a reduction of expenditures in the future. Uh, and that uh, it will reduce our deficit and our debt uh, over the next 10 years. And there is a committee of members of Congress that are now negotiating. And if they do not reach an agreement, there will nonetheless be automatic across-the-board cuts in government spending. So people should have confidence in the ability of the American government to deal with the financial problems that we have to get our fiscal house in order. But let me also say that it's in... Uh, the self-interest of all other economies in the world to have the United States economy as strong and as vibrant and as healthy as quickly as possible. Because certainly a strong U.S. economy means that more people uh, have jobs, 
have disposable income, making purchases, and we know that many of those purchases involve items from all around the world. So the more Americans are working and have income, uh, the more they will be buying things not just made in America, but made in China, made in Europe, made in India, and that's good for the workers of all those other countries. I remember vividly when uh, Ambassador Locke was the governor of uh, the state of Washington. He was promoting uh, Washington apples uh, to Chinese consumers. You literally cut them open in the supermarket in, in China, promoting American products to China. But probably the biggest American export to China uh, is uh, the U.S. dollars. It also has Washington on it. And uh, Mr. Li Daokui, I would like to ask you, um, most economists in China tend to believe that the U.S. dollars um, will be devalued. And um, uh, there are a lot of legitimate concerns about um, the purchasing capacity of China's immense, huge foreign reserves. Um, how did it happen? Well, I think uh, for uh, scholars and government officials alike in uh, China, they are quite right in uh, being concerned about the uh, debt dynamics and the uh, future trends of uh, U.S. dollars of the United States. Because it appears to us that uh, in so far as agreement uh, between the uh, Congress and the uh, White House is concerned, it is not as decisive as you have described. It's just to buy more time to procrastinate the solution to sometime in the future. And I think uh, the U.S. economy, like the Chinese economy, is also a binary economy. It has a very competitive sector, like uh, Boeing from the Washington State uh, and uh, Apple, not, not, not uh, the Apple PC, as well as uh, uh, the uh, wood industry, uh, the timber industry of uh, Washington State. However, on the, other on the other hand, there are so many uh, Latin American immigrants uh, in the United States who cannot even speak English well, and they cannot catch up with the pace of globalization. So for the uh, US challenges today, I think they are far more grimmer than those confronting uh, President Ronald Reagan and uh, Prime Minister uh, Margaret Thatcher in early uh, 1980s. And your challenge is around a fundamental shift of the economy, so as uh, for the lower strata of the labor force to be able to catch up uh, with globalization, you need to reduce welfare uh, uh, budgets a lot. Well, it's not time to uh, find a solution for the United States, but uh, please describe the situation in China, talking about our huge foreign exchange reserves. And I think it is our own option to build so many foreign exchange reserves. The United States has never forced us to buy the treasury bonds of the United States. And our trade, our commodities, our exports, and many things from China are denominated in USD. If USD is to devalue rapidly, China will be under huge impact. Could you talk about the origin of this dependency? And in this era, with this future of US economy in in the horizon, uh, should we step up or accelerate the internationalization of the RMB? And uh, should we guard more against uh, the risks of the US economy? I don't think uh, we should blame anyone for the dependency. It is a result of the, uh, the past two decades of globalization of the global economy uh, dynamics. And in the process of uh, economic globalization, uh, some countries have some sectors uh, weakening, while the same sectors in other countries are becoming more uh, competitive, uh, so that uh, during a certain period of time, in some countries there are higher savings rates, in others there are uh, lower savings rates, and uh, uh, money uh, flows from uh, China to the United States, uh, whose interest rate uh, was higher at that time. So we shouldn't blame anyone for it, but uh, as Premier Wen Jiabao has uh, put it, we have a so wise ambassador of the, uh, from the United States to China, we should uh, exercise our wisdom in finding a solution. Uh, we should not only uh, care about uh, our treasury bond uh, positions, uh, but also thinking more about uh, diversifying our investments. So only with the diversification of our investments, 
away from the Treasury bonds to the physical economy of the United States, including the uh, expressways, the highways of the, of the United States, it would be better. But it requires a cause for reform in the U.S. as well, uh, such as uh, your uh, highway, railway, and postal uh, systems. If those reforms have taken place, there will be plenty of money from China, from other emerging markets, from Middle East, uh, over 10 trillion uh, U.S. dollars uh, are ready to be invested into the United States. So we are waiting for those reforms. Without those reforms, the only thing we can buy is your Treasury bond. It will hurt both. Chairman Wang Jianling, if uh, Dalian Wanda holds so many U.S. dollars, and given the debt problems and the uh, euro uh, debt uh, crisis in the headline, how would you manage your uh, USD denominated assets? Well, I'm proceeding it from a microscopic point of view. If you have uh, many uh, much uh, foreign currency, uh, given the de facto devaluation of both the USD and the euro, I will stop buying uh, treasury bonds. I will uh, start buying natural resources or other physical investments. And I think uh, for the jobs in the United States and for Chinese FDI into the United States, it's uh, quite limited. And I think uh, the United States is still restricting uh, high-tech exports to uh, China. Put it simply, for a container a load of uh, high-tech exports to be exported to China. It will bring a whole container vessel of goods back to the United States. And I think it will be something very good. And uh, I, China is the largest developing economy, while the U.S. is the largest developed economy. We have a very strong complementarity between our respective economies. So we're not conflicting with each other. But most importantly, both of us should open up fields for investment, uh, sectors for investment. For the uh, retail and service uh, and manufacturing and IT uh, sectors in China, the leading companies in China are American companies. But for Chinese investments in the, in the United States, we are just opening a few Chinese restaurants uh, because the uh, sectors for Chinese investments are uh, not opened up yet. Well, while you know, tens of, uh, tens of uh, hundreds of billions of uh, US dollars from China are awaiting for the opening up of those uh, sectors to be invested in. Uh, an area in which uh, I and the embassy and the U.S. government wants uh, to focus on uh, both of the points uh, raised by uh, our, our two speakers. Uh, with respect to Mr. Wong, uh, uh, we've had a good conversation last night at dinner. Uh, there's a lot of misperception about the investment opportunities in the United States. Uh, there are almost no fields, almost no sectors, except for very, very few, that are restricted in terms of foreign direct investment. So we have companies from Russia, from uh, Germany, from Korea, from Japan, from Brazil, from India that actually uh, own uh, substantial holdings and have substantial holdings in the United States. Whereas in China, of course, uh, many of the national champions in the various industries, whether it's in steel or whether it's in uh, uh, natural resources, are prohibited from any type of foreign investment. And if there is foreign investment, whether from Europe or the United States, it's limited to no more than 49%. Uh, but um, uh, on infrastructure, uh, as, uh, we very much welcome foreign direct investment, and we're looking at public-private partnerships. Uh, the federal government is not in the business now of paying for all of these infrastructure projects. At the state and the local level, uh, those local governments are looking for private sector investors. And so, for instance, in California and Las Vegas, there's a big interest in uh, public-private partnership on high-speed rail. And many of those entities are actively encouraging participation from China. So we welcome that foreign direct investment. Uh, and so what we at the embassy, uh, uh, under my tenure as ambassador, working with uh, uh, the Commerce Department and others back in the United States, we will be holding a lot of seminars and reaching out to uh, some of the, uh, the prominent uh, Chinese companies informing them of the incredible and very large investment opportunities in the United States. And so uh, that is our job. We've got to break down some of the myths and some of the misperceptions because we do welcome a foreign direct investment. That will help make the Chinese companies more prosperous while creating jobs in the United States if those Chinese companies establish operations, facilities, manufacturing plants uh, in 
the United States the same way that the Korean and Japanese and even German uh, automobile uh, companies have created operations uh, in the United States, the same way that uh, German companies have created steel mills uh, and steel processing facilities in the United States. Thank you, Ambassador Locke. Um, Chris, I'm sure India is watching what's happening in, in Europe with great concerns as well. Uh, what are some of the actions the Indian government and the business community are considering taking to uh, hedge the risks? So clearly, in an interconnected economy that we are today, um, you know, all of us will slow down um, as, as the global economy slows down. And that is the reason why we have to look at coordinated action. You know, what happened in 2008 across governments, across um, countries, I think, is an important uh, uh, example or a, a lesson for all of us to say that in today's world, we have to uh, take coordinated action. Uh, Indian economy is also slowing down now. You know, we were expecting a growth rate of about 8 9%. Now we're looking at probably closer to 7%. And for a developing economy like India, um, this 2 percentage reduction has a significant impact because um, you know, what we expected happen maybe in 5 years, 10 years, now will take 15, 20 years actually because of this slowdown. So it has an impact on India. Um, there is awareness now, there is um, um, a, an urgency from the government to look at uh, restarting the reforms, uh, look at um, uh, working with other governments. From the business side also, there is clearly an awareness that uh, we need to um, make investments in other parts of the world. So as Infosys, for example, we are making investments in China, we are making investments in Europe, we are making investments in US. So we are actually uh, spreading our wings to different markets. Uh, I also want to add one more thing. Um, as we look at uh, you know, the development going forward, uh, when you look at um, uh, about 4 billion people who are still in developing economies, whereas 2 billion people are in the developed economies, uh, what is the right model for us to uh, develop? You know, considering both the economy as well as the environment, and what should we be doing? And this is where I think uh, experiments and innovations with China, with India, and of course um, the largest economy today in the world, which is the US, which is a $14 trillion economy. I think we will have to work together again. So not just in the economy, but in the area of uh, climate change, environment, etc. We have to work together to figure out what is the right model for development for the remaining 4 billion people who are still developing. Mr. Li, um, there has been a lot of talks in China lately among the policymakers and economists like you that uh, China needs to quote unquote save the US economy. China needs to save the European economy. China needs to buy more of the uh, debt from certain uh, troubled European countries, as if by saving these countries, these economies, uh, we're saving China itself. Uh, is there some truth in that? Uh, well, I don't think China can save anybody's uh, uh, trouble. By the way, I switched to English because I want a better understanding exchange with our uh, esteemed ambassador. Okay. I don't think any country can be saved by China. In today's world, a country can only save itself by its own fundamental policy reforms. However, I have to um, I have to stress that these countries, including the U.S., should appreciate one very, very important fact. That is, a significant proportion of your sovereign debt is being held by sovereign investors like Chinese uh, currency exchange authority. And we are the Chinese authority. We are the most patient, perhaps arguably the most cooperative investors in the world. Imagine if the 3.2 trillion US dollar currency reserves is being controlled by Mr. George Soros. What would happen? Mm -hmm. I'm sure he have already been underselling the US economy, US, US, US treasury bonds. Your financial market would be in much bigger chaos than it is. So China is already showing a very, very positive attitude towards all these countries in trouble. However, I emphasize fundamental reforms should be implemented, and in the process, 
that all parties should cooperate, should negotiate, should have further and deeper understanding of each other's interests. From a Chinese point of view, the last thing we want is protectionist policy from the US and Europe. Like in the tire issue, the tire, the passenger car tire issue, which is a classic example, this protectionist policy didn't help China. It didn't help the US at all because your total volume of import from all over the world actually increased after this special policy rather than decreased. So I think China is ready to help. Meanwhile, we also need better understanding from the US, from Europe, of China's needs. And Ambassador Locke, we can take that question a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Much of what uh, Mr. Lee was arguing is that in the US, uh, politics always trump economics, and now it's even more so than previously. The political paralysis in Washington is making investors around the world nervous about the government's ability uh, to make ends meet. Um, and this morning, I checked that President Obama's uh, disapproval ratings just went up again. So what, what gives you confidence that the politicians in Washington will do the right thing? Well, first of all, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, with respect to the U.S. Uh, treasuries, uh, China only holds about uh, 7 or 8 percent uh, of those treasuries, and that almost 70 percent of those treasury uh, T-bills are actually owned by Americans. And so it's in the economic self-interest of Americans uh, to make sure that our economy is strong uh, and, uh, and other countries that uh, hold those, uh, those uh, T-bills. Again, China only holds less than about uh, 7 or 8 percent of those T-bills. Um, I have confidence that the American uh, po political system will work. It's, not a, it's, it's sometimes a little bit messy, uh, but the reality is that we did reach an agreement. We did raise the debt ceiling. Uh, and in doing so, there was an agreement to lower our deficit, and there are immediate cuts across the board that are being instituted by the U.S. government, and further cuts uh, to uh, uh, ensure our fiscal stability and our fiscal health, with even additional 1.5 or 1.4 billion dollars in cuts. And if the members of Congress cannot reach an agreement, those cuts of 1.4, 1.5 trillion dollars will take effect automatically. Uh, so it's actually in the self-interest of the political leaders to make sure that these cuts are strategic and are as wise as possible as opposed to across the board cuts. But again, it shows the commitment and the willingness uh, of the President and the Congress to make these tough decisions. Now, let me just also say that um, uh, we know that we need to move away from a, a debt-ridden uh, society, that there has to be more savings among American people, and that's why we also have to have a more, uh, a less uh, borrowing within the federal government as, as an entity. Uh, and that's why the president has really focused on innovation. That's part of our strategy. That we've got to get away from these asset bubbles uh, and uh, so much attention to financial services and that the wealth of the country is not by buying and selling and trading, but on making things, on innovating, uh, and on infrastructure, as Professor Lee indicated. And so um, uh, states all across America are ramping up, gearing up, increasing their investments on infrastructure because we know that we have to fix our roads and our bridges sooner or later. The longer we wait, the more expensive it is. And uh, uh, if you do it now, not only do you save money, but you put people to work and that creates jobs. And all those people who design the roads, the construction workers themselves, they shop in malls, eat in restaurants, buy cars, remodel their homes, uh, so they support many other workers throughout the economy. The president has also successfully included in the budget, and the Congress has passed, more funding for R&D, uh, more research at uh, federal, federally government-sponsored research, as well as proposed tax credits for businesses to uh, implement and engage in more research and development. That's going to be the strength uh, of our economy, innovation. Uh, and uh, so we're trying to get, get back uh, to uh, what America has always done best. Now we would like to uh, take some questions from the, the floor on the uh, theme, how should uh, China effectively uh, keep its uh, immense savings intact uh, amid a global debt crisis? Questions are, or comments are invited. Please identify yourself and uh, try to keep it short. Now the floor is open to questions. 
the issue in front of us is how can China keep its high savings amidst the global debt crisis. This is a question about China's foreign currency management and visions about China's overseas investment. Now the floor is open for questions. Please keep it brief. I think there is one solution. China's brands, in particular quality brands, can work together and move out to um, the rest of the world, for instance the U.S. If we can expand Chinese brands in the U.S., that will help facilitate China's economy and create more jobs and tax revenue for the U.S. This can also use China's U.S. currencies and translate from made in China to created in China. Just last week, we founded a club supported by um, uh, Britain and Belgium. So my question is to Gary. Does the U.S. welcome quality brands in China to converge into the U.S. to create their own brands? We think that's a win-win solution. What's your view on this? In particular, when Chinese companies are trying to go global, they face challenges of visa applications, actually hindering many Chinese companies from accessing the U.S. market. They would have to go to the U.S. through distributors, but distributors will not generate brand effects. So could you give us a detailed answer, a clear answer as to what's the attitude of the U.S. for quality brands into the U.S.? So Visa, that's what you're interested in. Um, we don't have any problems for Visa. We don't have any, any problems for our individual Visa. But we're not the one that is going to setting up a branch offices in the U.S. We have to send our people. But our people are finding difficulties in having their visas approved, in, partic in particular work visa. So I'm waiting for a clear answer from the ambassador. On, on, uh, I'd like to answer both of those questions. We very much welcome Chinese brands. Uh, and we already have uh, numerous uh, Chinese brands uh, uh, that are gaining in popularity and becoming more well known among the American people. Lenovo, uh, your tablet uh, PC, uh, as well as Hire, uh, your appliance maker. Uh, look at just the great popularity of, of Chinese products in American daily life already. A lot of the refrigerators that Americans use under American brands are actually made in China, along with microwave ovens and so many uh, uh, electronic uh, goods. And so I think that as uh, the industries develop in China, uh, you're going to see them perhaps using their own names instead of using other uh, names. Look at the Korean names. Uh, on, on uh, television sets and things like that, how popular they are in the United States. I think the key sometimes to success, market strategy, is coming up with the right name that Americans uh, can, uh, will, will uh, uh, support or resonate with. Uh, you can use, come up with a bad name, whether it's a, a European automobile, and it will never be popular. So uh, I think Chinese companies have to spend a little bit of time and energy on marketing strategy and, uh, and uh, coming up with, uh, with the right name of a product. With respect to visa applications, we have long uh, recognized that we in the United States government and our embassies, not just in, uh, uh, in China, but in other countries around the world, are too slow uh, in processing visas and making it too difficult for both tourists, students, and uh, business travelers to come to the United States. That's a major undertaking, a major area of focus for me as ambassador here in China. Uh, but also for President Obama and the State Department. So we are aware that our visa policies are discouraging both business travel uh, as well as uh, uh, tourists uh, to uh, come to the United States, and uh, we intend to fix that. Thank you. Good to know. Um, the gentleman in the second row, and the gentleman in the second row first. Hello, good morning. My name is Gervais Warner. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm the president and CEO of Neil Massey group of companies. Uh, thank you for allowing us to be here this, eve this, this morning. My question actually is twofold, one, maybe one part for Mr. Lee and one part for Mr. Gopal, Gopalakrishnan. Uh, we in the Caribbean have seen a number of investments by Chinese companies or the Chinese government 
uh, in terms of helping with infrastructure projects or even in entering into some of our upstream exploration uh, industries. But a number of occasions, these investments come largely uh, direct in terms of funds or Chinese workers, Chinese companies coming in, and very little done in terms of developing local content, uh, transferring technology or skill sets, uh, which I know are very important um, uh, policies when multinationals come to China. And so my question to you, Mr. Lee, is where is China going? Where are Chinese companies going vis-a-vis -vis when they go out expatriating in terms of uh, recognizing their role in helping uh, smaller developing countries develop and grow as, as did uh, China? And uh, in India, Mr. Gopalakrishnan, uh, there are a number of Indian companies that have been quite successful in, if you like, the outsourcing world like your own. And I think, again, there are opportunities in other developing countries for leading giants like yourselves uh, from India to uh, similarly uh, come into uh, developing countries and, and do, uh, create similar enterprises and, and uh, local content and development of education, et cetera, as you've done in India. And I'd love if both of you gentlemen could uh, speak a little bit more about Chinese and Indian leadership in uh, sort of replicating the kind of growth and development that both of your companies have come, countries have come to enjoy. Thank you. Well, I think the key word is spillover. <coughs> spillover in English, right? That is, if you look at China's early experience of attracting foreign direct investment, in the early days, China did not have all those technologies coming in. China did not even have all the so-called benefits coming to China. However, China kept on opening the doors. Eventually, the spillover effect took over. That is, with more and more foreign investors into China, more Chinese workers got hired, more technicians being trained and the more local enterprises being established. So that process, I believe, is happening in your country in the other area. That is, with gradual and the continued pooling of Chinese investments, the local economy will benefit and eventually will benefit. Let's be patient. Thank you. So, um, you know, replicating the IT services model. This is something which the IT services industry in India has been doing for many years. Um, for example, you know, we have now set up operations in Philippines. Uh, in China, we have very large operations uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, in Mexico, in Brazil. Um, we are actually transferring our knowledge through the engineering colleges around the world uh, by collaborating with them on curriculum development, training the teachers. Uh, and we are doing this um, with uh, support from the governments around the world, actually. In fact, um, uh, you know, multiple governments have sent uh, batches of 100 students to actually come to India. They are not our employees, but they just come, get trained, and all we request is sponsorship from the government. And they will come to India, and they'll get trained, and they'll go back. So the Indian IT industry has been doing. There is a sector within the IT industry, which is um, education and training, and that sector has been establishing um, training operations actually around the world. So, uh, Indian IT services industry for um, for its um, uh, necess you know, for its uh, need of uh, creating talent around the world, is creating operations around the world, is also sharing its uh, its uh, expertise in training, etc., to other countries. Last uh, question from the. Uh, well, as a Chinese. I'm from the China Entrepreneurs uh, Magazine. The Premier Wen Jiabao, in his keynote speech, has made a proposal to President uh, Obama of the United States to rebalance the Chinese and U.S. economic inter inter interactions and uh, uh, to solve the debt issue. We should uh, take a debt-to-equity approach. And I think the debt-to-equity uh, solution has been quite uh, successful in China's SOE uh, reform and restructuring. So my question is for uh, Ambassador Locke. What do you think of the uh, debt to equity uh, proposal made by uh, Premier Wen Jiabao? The second question is for uh, Dr. Li. If this is to uh, happen, uh, will it uh, bring about some problems uh, uh, that all the equity will be taken by state-owned companies in China? And Mr. Wang, if uh, private companies have a chance, would you participate in it or not? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let me just say that uh, uh, we would, for instance, welcome uh, Mr. Wong investing in the United States. 
uh, and moving away from ownership of, of T-bills uh, to actually investment of assets uh, in the United States and helping create jobs in the United States. Uh, Mr. Wong has a very successful history of uh, entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur and developing uh, commercial real estate and many other facilities. We welcome that uh, in, in America. And again, the United States is one of the most open economies in the world for foreign direct investment. We have, if you look at the restrictions of American investment or European investment in China, uh, there is a huge uh, dichotomy uh, and, and a huge contrast. So we very much welcome that. And another thing that uh, Premier Wen Jiabao was talking about was export controls. We are in the process of reforming our entire U.S. export control system uh, to take things out of uh, the categories that are almost prohibited now from exports to or make it very difficult uh, to export to, uh, to uh, China and other countries. It's actually moving to the department that I used to head up, the Commerce Department. Uh, and that will uh, enable many of these items, as long as they're not being used for military purposes, to be exported. Uh, and uh, many things won't even require a license at all. So we, are, we understand the changes that have to take place. Uh, and that uh, we understand that uh, China has enormous needs. Uh, and that the Chinese people also highly valued uh, and have a great demand for made in USA goods and services. And we want to uh, facilitate that trade as a way of, uh, of um, addressing our, uh, our uh, uh, trade deficits uh, and the imbalance of trade. Uh, but again, we believe that uh, more foreign direct investment into the United States would be helpful. It is welcome. Uh, and second of all, we also want to sell more items uh, that uh, are currently restricted uh, to China uh, to help address that situation. Uh, well, I think for the debt to equity proposal, we should understand it in a broader way. It not just uh, takes place at a narrow corporate uh, sense. The United States government does not hold assets, otherwise it would not have needed to raise debt ceilings. The only assets are the White House or the Pentagon. You're not go never going to sell Pentagon or the White House uh, the, to the Chinese government. So uh, for the incremental uh, part of the uh, foreign exchange reserve holding, it should be invested into the uh, physical sector of the U U.S. economy, such as the private sector of the U.S. economy. The U U.S. economy is a binary one. There are many uh, excellent performers like uh, Boeing and Intel and Apple, which are closely related uh, in China. Maybe we should uh, make equity investments in these types of uh, companies in a more proactive way. And I think uh, oh, when the global outlook or the confidence in the uh, Treasury bond of, of the United States is stabilized, we can liquidate some of our holdings. After st stabilization is achieved, then the uh, liquidated cash uh, can be turned into a kind of a private sector investments into Apple, into uh, Boeing, uh, buy more shares from those companies for those companies to expand production. I don't think SOE from China will play a main part in this uh, process. And I think private companies uh, will uh, take the lion's share of uh, such activities. Yes, uh, Mr. Wang has uh, conveyed it uh, uh, quite well. Uh, his colleagues and he himself would like to buy more assets overseas. Yeah, for the uh, debt to equity uh, kind of uh, proposal, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Lee's uh, understanding. The U.S. economy is a private economy, uh, not a state-owned economy. So the debt to equity proposal is a very good one, but uh, it's not so practicable. And uh, for the equity that is on offer, maybe you don't want it, but for the equity you want to have, it is not available for sale. Uh, for example, if you want to take equity positions in Apple, is it possible or not? Uh, no. And uh, also, I've, uh, talked to, I've talked to the top seven or eight uh, hotel groups in the United States. They have refused any equity taking from my group. So. I think it's a corporate, uh, inter-corporate interactions uh, with compromises, and if anything is deemed fit, the debt to equity uh, operation will occur. But it depends on the market. Now let's.
uh, move on to the next topic, which is closely related with Mr. Wang's uh, sector. Uh, given the uh, inflationary expectations, what about the future growth prospects of the property sector in China? Uh, since 1998 of the housing reform in uh, China, a large part of the Chinese growth uh, has come from real estate, uh, real estate and uh, uh, related uh, sectors. And investment, uh, consumption and export are closely related uh, with land, with uh, properties as well. If we take a, take a look at the fiscal uh, revenue of some eastern provinces, uh, the uh, land sale proceeds used to account for 40% of a government uh, fiscal revenue, but that era is gone, it's gone forever. Um, it's no longer the case uh, to rely on the land sale uh, proceeds. With that era gone, what impact will it have in a negative way on Chinese growth prospects in the future? I don't think the uh, land-dominated uh, fiscal uh, structure is gone. Why do I say so? For the local government uh, fiscal revenue, they are still highly dependent on uh, land sale proceeds with the path dependence uh, from 1998 and uh, to the uh, early uh, 21st uh, century, there was nationwide massive uh, transfer of uh, land rights uh, because the uh, budgetary uh, fiscal revenue cannot support uh, the rapid growth that China has enjoyed for so many years. So the uh, land sale uh, proceeds have played a pivotal role in China's growth. Uh, and I just returned from Russia yesterday, and I uh, paid a visit to the U.S. in May. I witnessed the aging of much of the infrastructure because everything depends on fiscal investments, like roads and bridges, uh, Russia and the U.S. alike. So the, they do not have uh, uh, toll roads, they uh, do not have uh, land transfer uh, proceeds, so for the land-dominated uh, fiscal structure, it has its negative side, but however, over the past two decades, relying on such uh, proceeds, we have secured uh, hyper-growth of uh, China. So for every coin, it has two sides. So uh, for the minus side, many local economies uh, do not feature a strong IT and high-tech component, and uh, the bulk of the economy focuses on the land, on the uh, property sector. That's a minus side. And I think, as I've said, there are two sides of the coin. There is a problematic side as well. But uh, it is not an overnight effort uh, that we can remove all the dependency on land sales uh, transfers because those uh, problems have accumulated for the past two decades. It takes time to be phased out, maybe 15 or 20 years. But is there so much land remaining to be available? The best parts of the land have already been transferred. Well, I think it's a miscomprehension. Why? We do not have to take arable land for commercial development. For example, in Dalian, by filling uh, some of uh, the uh, sea, uh, we can reclaim land uh, from the sea and we can pursue a more intensive part kind pattern of uh, land usage by uh, increasing the uh, plot ratio of uh, property uh, developments. Well, we should uh, phase out uh, the over-reliance on land in our local fiscal revenue. But at present, uh, everybody is blaming the property sector. The property sector is becoming a culprit in the eyes of everybody. However, the co property sector is contributing 2 to 3 percent to China's growth every year, China's growth rate. So no other sector can take its place. So at all levels of the government, uh, central and local, we should find um, replacement uh, sector to uh, replace the uh, contribution of the property sector as soon as possible, but it takes time. Uh, if uh, there's a hard landing, landing there is, if there's a prohibition on all land sales, then the government will not be able to pay salaries. And what about uh, the property austerity measures? Is it nearing an end? No, it's going to for the long haul, uh, for the sales restriction policies and other austerity measures. They are here to stay. And the uh, government are uh, using time uh, to uh, buy uh, space. With three to five years, the low-cost housing will account for roughly 50% of all the housing supply. And at that time, there will be exits of the austerities. I fully agree. 
for the property uh, sector uh, development, it is an epitome of the growth mode of uh, China. China used to rely on the land-based uh, fiscal revenue. It uh, came to us very soon just by you know, uh, selling a piece of land. Yeah, it was quick and effective. Uh, uh, however, it resulted in a lot of uh, credit debit kind of uh, problems between uh, different uh, uh, governments or different terms of uh, uh, government. And at present, uh, the other approach is that for the government to hold some land uh, to pursue industry, service, or low-cost low cost housing uh, developments, and then there will be a future stream of uh, tax revenue. That's a very important transition, but also that's a painful uh, process. For example, last year we grew by 10.4%, and we need to slow down to 9.5% uh, this year. This 1% uh, slowdown is going to be very painful, but we have to smooth this difficulty. We have to surmount this obstacle. Otherwise, the situation in China will be even more dire uh, than the United States uh, pre-2007-2008. And uh, for the property sector in China, the uh, poor people cannot buy any housing, so it will aggravate our uh, social confrontation. For the subprime uh, mortgage crisis in the United States, it has this positive side, but for our housing crisis, it has no positive uh, side. And I think the, the determination has been made in the two to th uh, next two to three years, there will be uh, further like a soft landing or slowdown of the uh, property sector. We should uh, fully embrace it for the Chinese economy to grow on a more sustainable and healthy footing. And I think a uh, 2% uh, uh, price drop every year is the price we must, take, uh, we must pay. But it should take place over a long period of time. It should not be rushed. And also for European and American economies, it is very uh, slow going because those governments do not have any land to sell. So then, given that uh, background, uh, my question is for Ambassador Locke. Of real estate telling us uh, about how China should manage its own real estate market. Well, I don't think that uh, we in the United States have been really making any comments about uh, the real estate market. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get our own uh, real estate markets back in shape uh, with uh, housing uh, prices and, and uh, real estate construction uh, are very, very depressed right now. Uh, but obviously, as, as Professor uh, Lee indicated, uh, there have to be some structural changes in the Chinese economy. There have to be structural changes in the U.S. economy. None of these things are going to be able to take place overnight. Uh, we know that, for instance, and the Chinese leaders have indicated and, uh, that uh, China needs to move away from being so dependent on exports uh, and focusing more on domestic consumption and meeting the needs of the Chinese people. Uh, China has an enormous uh, social safety network problem as uh, more and more Chinese citizens uh, are elderly. Uh, how, how do we support, uh, how, how does China as a society uh, take care of the social medical uh, needs of that aging population? We face the same problems in the United States and we're trying to make changes with respect to our social safety network. Uh, several years ago, uh, President Clinton embarked on a uh, very significant welfare reform in the United States. And we made those tough decisions, and it's actually worked out very, very well, uh, by and large. But we still have a long ways to go in terms of making sure that Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid are sound. Um, but we're, I think we're up to that challenge. We in the United States, as an economy, have to focus more on uh, 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 exports. We need to uh, uh, focus again on innovation, as President Obama has indicated. We need to move away from uh, so being so consumed uh, on debt, whether personal household debt or debt uh, by the government. And we are making those changes. Thank you. Chris. <clears throat> See, as, a, um, as an economy develops, as more people move to middle, age, middle income group, uh, one of the first things they are going to look at is um, you know, buying a house, buying a flat, etc. And so the demand increases and the supply is of course limited always because land you can't create. Of course you can go into the sea and um, reclaim land but primarily land is limited and price will actually go up. Now it has to be managed properly otherwise you will create a bubble which everybody knows now today. And you will create a bubble and that's what we need to protect yourself because um, you know, this is uh, happening even in India actually. In India also land prices have become exorbitant. It's unaffordable to a segment of population. 
and that creates social tensions and uh, unhappiness. Um, when you also look at uh, you know the the, the mortgage um, uh, phenomenon, etc. That's why you have to control this and manage this properly. Otherwise, you know when when the demand slows down, when uh, there is a downturn in the economy, and downturns can happen. You know we have seen volatility is there. It will it will create a bubble, and that's something which we have to all be very careful about and manage properly. And uh, you know the the simple solution. Um, is not there, and if the simple solution was there, it would have been it would have been solved. So, you know that's why I think we have to figure out how this can be solved. Um, uh, I want to interrupt Mr. Wang Jianlin, sir. Now, so my question is to Mr. Wang. Speaking of you, most of the media in China were reminded of the commercial economy. Because a commercial um, real estate market, because you're always the leader in the commercial sector of the property market. Our next topic is about innovation. Some people are discussing about the shopping habits of the young people, the post-1980 generation. Most of them are doing online shopping. So once you have your IPO, you become the biggest private company in China by market capitalization. However, the concept of commercial property perhaps is not an attractive idea to the young people. Young people tend to buy things online. They go to the shopping malls to take a look, and then they go to Taobao.com. Taobao is talking about a one trillion RMB in sales revenue next year. So I was wondering whether your shopping malls can reach the large um, sales revenue as well. That's perhaps another misconception. The same is true to the U.S. online shopping a few years ago. Some people were making judgments about the decline of the retail industry in the U.S., but the retail industry in the U.S. did not die. The online shopping was increasing, but the overall retail industry is on the increase as well. The percentage of the online industry was not increasing as much. Even if online industry, online shopping has been increasing by around 10% um, every year, but the retail industry has also been increasing by 15% every year. So I'm not thinking that the uh, non-conventional uh, shopping will replace the conventional shopping. Second, Wen Da advocates experience-based shopping. Within Wen Da, we set up our goal to reduce our retail percentage to below 50 percent. In other words, the shopping concept is much wider than buying things. If you're going to a shopping mall and then you consume by uh, going to karaoke or watching movies, that's another way of shopping. So this is not online shopping. In the internet bubble stage, people were thinking that the exhibition uh, was going to die, but that's not happening. So the model that you're talking about is perhaps about a new growth point in your industry. Is that so? Now the floor is open to questions. We're opening up our floor to comments and questions. Please identify yourself first. Uh, discussion to the floor. Once again, please identify yourself and uh, share with us briefly your comments or questions on the second topic. I'm sure after this discussion, you're fully aware of the importance of the real estate market to, to China. I'm from a Zhejiang company. I'm a member of IBC. So on behalf of the new generation of innovators and entrepreneurs, my question is, in the new round of growth, the developing countries, in particular China, tend to con be constrained by intellectual property issues. We have to leave this question to our next stage. The current topic is about property market. The gentleman over there, if your question is about the property market, could you please pass on the microphone? I'm from Xinhai Electronic Company. I'm also a member of IBC. 
Our company is largely involved in industrial automation. So my question is, in the property market in China, it seems that the property market is already the engine behind many other industries, such as house decoration and other supportive industries. With the slowdown in the property market, many other industries will be affected, such as our industry. Do you have any solutions in order to find an alternative way of developing the property market while reducing our dependency on the property sector. Professor Li, a very good question. Many people oppose the macro control or the policy change in the property market precisely due to the reason you've talked about. Mr. Wong was talking about the alternative way for the reduction of the 2% and decrease. I think that given the strategic importance of the property sector, we have to pay this price. And we have this replacement that is infrastructure development. In China every year, we face different kinds of uh, natural disasters, drought, earthquakes, etc. What does this tell? This shows that we are lagging behind in terms of facility development, public facilities indeed. I think in, in, in the next 20 to 30 years, we need to invest hugely in that sector that perhaps can make up for the deficiencies um, that the property market has suffered. Innovation, uh, a subject matter that uh, Ambassador Locke has previously mentioned. And personally, I fully agree with him that so long as the United States keeps its border open to immigrants and all the visa applicants, America will always have uh, the source of innovation and great ideas and great products and great companies. Um, however, when it comes to China, innovation has always been uh, an issue. If you take a look at many of the Chinese companies, many of the products are uh, probably more or less copycats of great products overseas, even in the IT sector. Uh, if you take a look at China's leading internet portals, most of them are the Chinese counterparts of, uh, of Google, um, of um, Amazon, uh, of Yahoo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so w I think we would all agree that innovation needs to be encouraged, protected, and properly rewarded. What, what might be China's new approach to encourage innovation so that one day uh, we can have a Chinese apple, a great uh, new company as well? Um, I would like to begin by asking Ambassador Locke to see if you have any ideas to share. Well, you know, I, I was meeting with a group of uh, Chinese uh, entrepreneurs uh, the other day, and we were talking about, uh, and actually a Chinese economists too, about the differences uh, in terms of what has made America great and what has made uh, China great. And one of the differences uh, that uh, this economist noted is that uh, China, the United States is, is a society that is open, uh, known for equality, uh, and one of opportunity and, uh, and freedom. And what makes that possible? It is predictability and a rule of law. Uh, this person was commenting and others were commenting how, uh, you know, uh, uh, the son or daughter of, of a high-ranking government official can be taken to court uh, and that uh, if, if they violated the law, uh, that if a Chinese company was unfairly uh, treated, uh, that that Chinese company can sue in the American courts and get justice. Uh, what makes America great is that predictability and that rule of law which underlines and serves as the foundation for freedom, equality, opportunity. Uh, so that people, immigrants from around the world can come to the United States knowing that if they work hard, uh, that if they get a good education, and even with just a few dollars in their pocket, they can succeed. And then they can take on the giants of, of America and indeed around the world. Clearly, if Chinese companies uh, want to innovate, they're going to want to have protections for their own intellectual property. Uh, and uh, that's going to require a, a rule of law. Uh, that means enforcement, strong enforcement of intellectual property rights, because 
if countries don't have strong intellectual property rights and a strong, predictable, reliable, fair legal system, one of two things will happen. Either that innovation will stop occurring within that particular country, or the innovators and the young people and the talent and the researchers and the scientists and the entrepreneurs of that particular country will go someplace else to engage in their innovation. And that's going to take away job opportunities for that particular country. So it is in China and other countries' economic self-interest to have a strong sense of rule of law, predictable laws uh, that, that are consistent, that are transparent, uh, and that are enforced. And uh, so um, I think uh, uh, clearly you have great talent here in China, great talent here in China, uh, with all the PhDs and engineers and scientists that you're producing. Uh, where will they innovate? and will they benefit the Chinese society? Chris, some say the Asian culture uh, does not particularly encourage innovation, our um, education tradition uh, as well. How did India manage to, to deal with that and produce great companies like Infosys? So um, I don't agree with this uh, proposition that the Asian culture does not um, uh, look at innovation. I think if the right environment and atmosphere is created, innovation can flourish anywhere in the world. Um, you know, where there is um, predictability, rule of law, meritocracy, um, you know, support from the government, opportunities are there, uh, education, a good education system, I think innovation can flourish anywhere. Um, the, the, there is a role for the government. The role for the government is to uh, create the rules of the game to make sure that the rules are implemented properly and appropriately and uh, as quickly as possible because the delays are also a factor here. Then there is a role for the private sector to make the investments and to create the entrepreneurs, to create the businesses that will bring products and services to market. You know, these are the principles in which you, know, you will see innovation happening. And, and, and that's what I think happening today. You know, if you look at uh, what has happened over the last 30 years, many of these things are being implemented in many countries in Asia. And uh, you know, markets are being opened up. Today, um, you know, more markets are open. Uh, we are an interconnected world. And that's the reason why global GDP growth has happened. So it is happening. And, 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 and that, I hope, is a continuous process. And this downturn that is happening is not going to reverse that. And, and if that does not reverse, uh, then I'm very positive to say that um, you know, the, the innovations will continue to happen and will happen in Asia also. We are seeing that in India. When India opened up its economy in 1991, linked its market to the global market, uh, there was initially concern whether Indian companies will be able to compete. But Indian companies have competed and done well in some of the sectors. IT sector is one of those sectors where you know, we can talk about. And, and, and that is what I think will happen when you confidently uh, make the right changes. Thank you. Um, back to Professor Li. In respect of China's innovation, China does not lack market and talents or capital, but China is different from India. India's development is perhaps a bottom-up approach, but China perhaps is more of a top-down approach. Some people were joking that India's economic growth and India's innovation is an India's absence of government, but China is because of the existence of China's government. Do you think that companies need to take more initiatives or need more guidance from the government. I think that before responding to your question, let me just comment on Ambassador Locke's remarks. He's an excellent ambassador transmitting the American values, the American message to China. In other words, to have innovation, you need to have the rule of law and IPR protection. But I don't agree with him. China's past 30 years of development is not necessarily a path of pure development. China is lagging behind many other countries. In this large space, we do not need a perfect system. We only need improvements or reforms in one or two areas. We have lots of people in R&D, 
in technology innovation. Once the system is in place, these people will call for IPR protection, will go to court for uh, the reward of justice. If China follows the U.S. model, then China will not be able to succeed. So I don't think that a single model succeeds. What about China's development? What about China's model of innovation? I think we need to look at two things. First, business model. As everything that is related to service already features innovation in China. For instance, internet, microblog, search engines, QQ, a social networking. If you look at indicators, China's development in this area has far exceeded the U.S., even India. Higher and higher has good service. Another thing is invisible. Uh, we are lacking behind in the manufacturing sector, in the technology sector. Well, we, we have the technologies coming from other countries. But I think that um, those areas that we are not clear of um, are the areas that we need more innovation. In the industrial sectors, we need to introduce innovation to reduce our price gap with our foreign competitors. I think that we are moving ahead in these two areas. What we need to do is to bring together capital and technologies in the financial sector to allow more space to the young generation. People like me should not be involved in more innovation. We should leave the space to people born after the 1970s and 80s. The has different political and, and legal systems, and no one is saying that China has to copy the United States model, nor should they copy the French or the German or the, uh, the UK model. But clearly, there has to be predictability, there has to be transparency in how the laws are made. I mean, you cannot go around having a country where something that is perfectly legal for many, many years is suddenly made illegal and people who were doing that activity a year before are suddenly thrown in jail or fined. I mean, that discourages innovation, that, uh, that uh, puts a damper on entrepreneurship. So there are basic universal legal principles that every society should have. And certainly China has been uh, for centuries uh, governed by laws and, and rules of conduct. Uh, and clearly now that uh, innovation is such an important part of every country's economy, there has to be a foundation that encourages that innovation. And uh, certainly if, if China does not uh, strongly enforce intellectual property rights, I'm not saying that innovation will not occur in China. But certainly, it, the full potential of the Chinese citizens will not be realized. And certainly, if you want the new entrepreneurs, the great young people who have great ideas, if they're going to put in their hard-earned money and their sweat and labor into pursuing these innovations, they will want to be rewarded. That is why the Chinese people are working so hard, because they want uh, prosperity. Uh, that is perhaps part of the genes or the genetic makeup of the Chinese. They're entrepreneurs, they're hardworking, they want success. They want to provide a better future for their own families and future generations. But if they cannot have uh, their hard-earned work and labor protected and properly rewarded, then that discourages innovation. Then they might go invest a few million dollars in the United States and go get American passports. Or they, yes, or they might um, move their operations to Korea uh, or to India. Uh, or later on uh, to Africa uh, and, uh, and other developing uh, parts of the world. So it's in China's own economic self-interest to continue its progress. It, they're making progress on rule of law, uh, but if you really want to maximize the, uh, the aspirations of the Chinese people, we need uh, even a more concerted effort on predictability, on sustained efforts, on promoting intellectual property rights protection, uh, and developing consistency and transparency in the legal system that, you know, just how it affects businesses, just how it affects businesses when laws are passed and when, whether they apply six months from now or whether they applied and, uh, and going backwards a, a year or so. Uh, I think people want that predictability, that certainty. 
Mr. Wang, having listened to the comments made by Professor Li and Ambassador Gary, considering the fact that many Chinese entrepreneurs, while having their own success, are choosing American, Canadian, or Singaporean passports, um, they're most in favor of Singaporean passports because Singapore is a country where you can speak Chinese and have Chinese food. What does this tell? So my question is, so your question is about um, the selection of passports. What does this tell? Perhaps two reasons. One is China's tradition. China has uh, 5,000 years of the feudalist society. So the rule by people is much bigger, is much more important than the rule of law. This has become a culture gene. Um, people in China, especially private businessmen, tend to have a sense of insecurity. American passports, a green card, will give them a greater sense of security. There is another reason. We have some problems in our system. In the initial stage of our reform and opening up, the private sector is develop was developing in a, a not so regulated way. If you look at laws in China, we have a, a way which is selective law enforcement. When the law is coming out, it seems that everybody will be violating the law. So there will be a selective way of law enforcement. So many uh, business leaders are quite afraid of such uh, selective uh, enforcement. They want to go out to avoid it. And uh, uh, many of those uh, SME uh, leaders uh, have left China for other countries. But for those leaders of larger companies, they are still in China. And f what about innovations in China? Everybody is talking about innovation in uh, uh, China. But uh, very few would uh, succeed. Very cautious note that we will have to uh, conclude this very interesting session on uh, the new frontiers of China's growth. I would like to thank you for all of your participation. And if you have questions or comments, please talk to any of those CCTV cameras roaming around the conference center. Tell them you have a point to contribute to this session. Finally, a warm round of applause for the panelists. Thank you all very much.